Right. This next reporting, although it might at times seem comical, it does raise uh, the question that we're going to show a little bit later on Mitt Romney and a lot of others um, uh, in the Republican Party who have asked the question as to, like, why? Why did he hold on to these um, classified documents. And one week after the latest indictment of Donald Trump, there is new reporting that would poke holes in one of the former president's defenses, despite claiming earlier in the week he, quote, hadn't had a chance to go through all the boxes he took with him to Mar-a-Lago. Former White House aides tell The New York Times Trump was unusually attached to those boxes and their contents throughout his presidency right, can you do that line again? and after leaving office. Are you saying he was unusually attached to unusually those boxes? Unusually attached to the boxes unusually to, and you know, that's their so contents. Interesting. So many people get unusually attached to uh, their human beings yes. or, you know, uh, <laughs> fates or what. But he he's unusually attached to those boxes. these boxes. He loved them. And he was obsessed with them. Uh -huh. The staffers reportedly referred to the boxes as Trump's, quote, Beautiful mind material Oof. in reference to the book and movie about Nobel Prize winning mathematician John Nash. Mm. So, Nash. so you're, you're saying, Willie, I don't think they meant that as a compliment. No. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no. there's John Nash's beautiful mind on the wall. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah anyway, it, he was diagnosed, Willie, of course, with schizophrenia as an adult. And he covered his walls in the office with newspaper clippings and documents. He thought he was hired by the U.S. government to, uh, to crack a Russian code. Yeah, John Nash, a brilliant man, but deeply, deeply troubled, as uh, Russell Crowe's portrayal showed us a few years ago. Two people familiar with the practice tell the Times Trump was meticulous about putting things in specific boxes and could, quote, generally identify what was in the boxes mm. most immediately around him. The former president also reportedly had a habit of bringing documents with him from the West Wing up to the White House residence and even what? went around his own staff system for tracking that material. Since leaving the White House, sources tell the Times, Trump has maintained that behavior, even filling up new boxes when those close to him have suggested he condense his collection or review it for classified material. Why? So, Joe, yeah. this again, this is coming from people close to Donald Trump. People have witnessed this behavior, and that was the running joke, I guess it was, inside the White House, that this guy is like John Nash in a beautiful mind, traveling with his documents, keeping his boxes, taking them upstairs. And as Maggie Haberman and the Times team points out, he was warned by members of his own staff, hey, don't take that stuff with you. That stuff right. is classified. That stuff stays here. So he knew not only what was at Mar-a-Lago was classified, but this goes back to the time when he was president, according to these sources. Well, and, and at least Two things that are important to Donald Trump. Two things, and only two things. It's not his family. It's no. not connections with people. It's money and fame. So or you ask why. Yeah. We'll find out why. Yeah, yeah, money, 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 power, um, and the power because it leads to money. Right. Um, so, so Elise, this is, again, this goes back to what I was saying before. Who are the people testifying? These aren't the libs. These aren't like you know. Mm -hmm. These aren't people in, in the Young Marxist League of, of Southern Manhattan. I mean, these are people that work for Trump, that are around Trump. They're mocking Trump. They're the ones testifying because, you know. I guess they can justify to their friends or their family, I'm going to work for Donald Trump. They can't justify going to federal prison for him. And they're all talking. This is so bizarre. Just the handling of the classified documents, even from the president. You have been around highly sensitive documents. The idea that he could just take something from the Oval Office to the White House and it wouldn't be handled by you know, the proper confidential assistant. It is so bizarre that so many holds just were let go and that he was essentially hoarding. I mean, right. he's a hoarder. It's like you hear these yeah. horrible stories about hoarding of animals. Right. And he was doing the same thing with these classified well, documents. This is the hoarding of nuclear secrets. Yes. Um, yeah, let's war, go to Richard War Hoss. plans. And Richard, you know, this we're, like we're, we're, we're funny, all funny, but sort not of, funny. Well, it's yeah, actually, we're sort of deadly serious. Smirking at the bizarre <laughs> behavior, but this is extraordinary. Look at that. Classified documents. Oh Again, that God. staff member took a picture of that and sent that to another staff member. 
But again, a lot of documents. the magnitude of these crimes, when you start thinking about the fact, I've talked about what would happen if I went to a briefing as a member of the Armed Services Committee, took a classified document back to my office, <laughs> FBI would be calling me in 15 minutes. You were around classified documents all the time. If you ever took one home, if you have, to, we're talking about one or two documents, right, that people get, get, get uh, the FBI, you know, will charge them. This guy, boxes and boxes and boxes of, of America's, uh, some of America's close, most closely guarded secrets. Yeah, it's hard to imagine because when the briefer came to brief you in the morning from the CIA, he carry the, he or she would carry the briefcase, very you know, clock carefully, opened up in your office, you'd be handed the documents, you'd read the documents, and then you'd hand them back. <laughs> they go back in the briefcase. So the idea that these things are thrown in boxes and mixed with kind of sports photographs. By the way, I want, I want, to, I, I want you to stop again, because again, for people that haven't been in government service, yeah. that people, that, again, that, that, that haven't had experience with handling even one classified document. I, I, I talked about the other day about briefings that I got in the 1990s that I still haven't told anybody about just because That's I was told not to tell anybody. And unless I called somebody and said, could I ask you about this portion of North Korea's nuclear program or about Iran's assets in this country or that country? Have you guys declassified that? You just, not only me, you, you working the State Department, nobody would imagine doing that. And th th this is why this is so grotesque what Kevin McCarthy and some Republicans are doing, because they would never do it, because they understand it's not just the crime, it is the scale of the crime. This is a tsunami of crimes, like regarding a United States president and some of our most sacred uh, classified uh, uh, secrets. Yeah, look, we all dealt with you know, hundreds, even thousands of classified documents in the course of a week or a month. Some were kept in files. The most sensitive went immediately back to the briefers who came every morning to give you your you know, the president's daily brief. He and a couple of dozen of officials would get it. Sure, I can imagine the odd document being filed in the wrong place. I had to do document searches. It does happen. It does happen. Okay. Right. That, but that's the odd document. Right. And it gets returned. Absolutely. What's so bizarre about this is the sensitivity. These are not sort of things maybe confidential. We're talking about stuff at the top of the, the security food chain. Uh, really, really limited distribution documents. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about this. By yes. the way, one other thing, too, well, because I know people are thinking about it while you're talking. Yeah. It's also not like Biden or Pence, yeah. where somebody mispacked something right. and sent something mm -hmm. to one of their, their annexes or offices or even uh, homes by mistake. And then they did a search. They found it. They sent it back. This is a guy that was rummaging through boxes filled with nuclear secrets. Well, and then going through my box. Do you feel have with these, war plans and knew what was in those boxes Weird. and refused to return them? Talk about proving intent a hundred times over. I'm angry. Um, the country is going to go through tumult as a result of one thing President Trump didn't turn over military documents when he was asked to do so. All he had to do was hand them in. I'm sure his counsel told him, hand the documents in, particularly when the subpoena came. But for some reason, he decided not to. He held on to them. Why? That's the question. Why is the country going to have to go through all this angst and tumult? Why did he just turn the documents in? That is the question. Yeah, that is the question. Welcome back to Morning Joe. It's Friday, June the 16th. A beautiful shot. Of the statue of the, a beautiful shot of the Empire State Building. No. I know. <laughs> Chapter <laughs> 4. Statue of Incredible <laughs> shot. Incredible shot of the Statue of Liberty. Just beautiful. Uh, hey, uh, so, Willie, we've been talking about how there's been sort of, sort of, uh, just sort of a leaking of support bit by bit. Mitt Romney never supported Donald Trump. It's never close to it, but still, Republicans speaking out against him is a rare thing. Romney's done that more than most, but still, when he comes out, when you have Mike Pence moving away from Trump the way he has over the past three days, you have other Republicans starting to actually speak the truth about how it is bad for people to steal nuclear secrets from the United States government. Uh, we are seeing a bit of a trend line here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, without question. Another why for Mitt Romney, as he was asking why, why does it always fall to Mitt Romney to be the Republican in the Senate to criticize <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump? But you're seeing more of it, as you point out. And our colleagues at NBC News have a new story that just posted out of the state of Nevada, where Adam Laxalt, who ran for Senate last year, who was you know, a, a supporter of Donald Trump through the years, the attorney general here just said plainly, he can't win here. And now he's back yeah. in with a super PAC, Ron DeSantis, because he's saying he lost twice. Do you think he's suddenly going to get back independent voters and get to a margin where he can win in Nevada? Just now, Republicans saying publicly, the guy can't win in our state. We've got to look somewhere else. And so he's backing Ron DeSantis. Well, when you have somebody like Laxalt, who is uh, Elise in it to win it for Donald Trump, some would yep. say maybe a bit too, too long, um, saying he can't win here. And he understands he's in Nevada. He's hearing from Republicans there. We're hearing it. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've been saying for some time, I've been starting to hear it from my friends who have been, been with him from the very beginning, through thick and thin. Um, they're, they're exhausted. They were exhausted before he got busted stealing nuclear secrets and he got caught on tape admitting as, such, as much. Donald Trump is going to get the nomination at current pace. Can he win? Can he win in Wisconsin? Can he win in Nevada? Can nope. he win in Arizona? Nope. Can nope. he even win in Georgia no. is questionable. Pennsylvania. So yeah. it's going to come down to these states. And there are some Republican strategists who might think that clinging to Donald Trump is the way to get those Senate candidates or their yeah. gubernatorial candidates over the line. And we didn't see that so happen this, last go around. This story, you know, there's a lot of stories about Donald Trump. This story is simple and Mitt Romney crystallized it. The I think the question that people are going to have, you interview a lot of Republicans, is why did he just give him back? Everyone else gave them back. Why didn't he give them back? And then we could avoid all of this drama and trauma yeah. on our democracy. It well, really is an inflection point that he has created mm -hmm. and he, a problem for he, himself. He's created, that he's created. And by the way, Jonathan Lemire, that's exactly what we heard from Carl Rove in the Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed yesterday. It's what we're hearing from Mitt Romney. It's what we're hearing from Andy McCarthy, uh, National Review. It's what we've heard from, from the National Review over and over again. People who have... I'm not talking about Andy McCarthy here, but so many people who've, who've spent the last seven years just wallowing, wallowing in anti-anti-Trumpism uh, to, to a laughable degree are now, you know, instead of like trying to own the libs to get the subscriptions up, they're actually starting to tell the truth. This guy stole nuclear secrets. There was no excuse for it. He can't win next year. It's unambiguous what he did. He had documents he shouldn't have had, and when they asked for them back, he said no, and he tried to hide them. And that, that is a pretty simple story to tell, and it's so different than what Biden and Pence did. And in terms of Republicans, I will say, talking to Republicans across the country, reporters who have fanned out, talking to voters, there is a sense that though, though Trump is still the number one choice, that his support's softer this time around. And then some Republicans who really liked him in 16, voted for him again in 20, still like him now, still say, hey, he was a good president. President, but there is a sense, a recognition that, hey, maybe he can't win and they'd be open to someone else. Now, who mm -hmm. that someone else is remains to be seen. Someone's going to have to step forward. Someone's going to have to win those votes. But there is a sense that, that though there is a small percentage of Republicans who will always be with Trump, always, 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 yep. others, even of his supporters, would at least entertain another candidate if that person, he or she, uh, can win them over. You know, there's so much, um, so much complaining about a two-tiered justice system and the weaponization of the justice system, it's also, I think, penetrating the ether and sort of getting out there that actually it's tiered toward Donald Trump. The DOJ was very careful in its process in terms of trying to retrieve the documents that don't belong to Donald Trump that are classified and highly, highly dangerous to have out there in the public eye. They took their time. Nobody else would get the time that exactly. Donald Trump Nobody. got. Nobody. Nobody. Anybody else in this situation, am I wrong, no, no, would be in they, custody? Anybody, uh, you know it from working in the State Department. I know it from working uh, in Congress. Richard was just talking about working in the White House. Any of us would have been in jail by now. I mean, if we'd had this many documents, they would never do a plea deal. He had every with, chance with to anybody, return them. 
other than Donald Trump. And this whole idea, you know, the, the, the big lie that there's a two-tiered justice system and what about Hillary? Please. That lie has blown to pieces because now people are waking up to the reality that Donald Trump tried to get the Justice Department to indict him in 17 and get a special counsel. They said there's nothing there. Tried in 2018 to get the, the Justice Department to appoint a special counsel. Say, sorry, Mr. President, there's nothing there. Just like James Comey said in 2016, a couple of months before handing the election to Donald Trump with that letter 10 days beforehand, said no prosecutor would bring a case against Hillary Clinton. So even that lie is being blown out of the water. The Biden crime family lie is being blown out of the water. And they're now being forced to look at Donald Trump. And they're seeing a guy that stole nuclear secrets, lied about it repeatedly, lied to the DOJ, lied to the FBI, lied to his own lawyers, lied to his own lawyers about it's it. It's a mess. And this is where they are. So now they're thinking, wait a second, do we really want to lose again? with a guy that stole nuclear secrets, or maybe we go for DeSantis or Tim Scott or Nikki Haley or somebody else. Donald Trump just looks like an idiot on this one. He had a chance. He could. He had a do-over. He couldn't bring it to, he couldn't bring himself to do it. And at the end of the day, if you're arguing about the refs, if you're arguing about DOJ and FBI, you're losing. Yeah. Yeah. As with anything in life, if you're arguing over the referees, you're losing. He has, as Andrew McCarthy said yesterday. I uh, uh, haven't. Uh, oh, okay. There's no defense. Yeah, let's hear it. He, he's talking to Hugh I'm Hewitt. Hugh Hewitt. And, and this is what he says and why he says it. In terms of the president's defense that he declassified the documents, I'm not saying it has merit, but how does he get that into the record without appearing as a witness? Uh, there would have to be, this is why I don't think he has a defense to you. He, first of all, I think if you do that under the Presidential Records Act, there should be a document supporting it. Otherwise, he's got to have a witness that shows that he did it. I don't think he has that. And I also think it's irrelevant because it's not a defense to these charges. But assuming he thinks it's a relevant argument and they want to make the argument to the jury, how do they even get the assertion that he declassified him in his mind into the record without him going on the stand? Go ahead. We, we can talk through the music. Could. Yeah, I don't see how he could do that. He's got to, if it's the operation of his mind, he's got to testify to it. Okay, first of all, we thank TJ for putting the honky saxophone <laughs> underneath that, 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 that bed. I think actually, I think that was actually Hugh Hewitt's show. But he said time and again, no defense. This is Andrew McCarthy, a conservative's conservative, a, a great, fierce, conservative legal mind who has defended Donald Trump a great deal. He didn't, he didn't in the election rigging, but in a lot of the impeachment stuff, he was there. Same with Hugh Hewitt. And, and just like so many other Republicans that have supported Donald Trump in the past, they're saying he's got no defense. That's what was so damning about the indictment. There's really two parts. One is the sheer scale of this. It's one thing to have the uh, document. This wasn't the exception. This was the rule. That's one thing. Second of all, that's where the obstruction charge is so important. If he had simply coughed him up, be it, we'd be in a total. We wouldn't be having. Oh, we wouldn't have this conversation. Can't exactly. on that. And that's what attorneys could. Yeah, exactly. I think politically, yeah. that's the most important point because voters really aren't going to differentiate why this is so different from right. what other officials have done, even though they should, because it is of a much greater scale. It's just the fact that he was offered an out right. as a privileged, powerful person, offered an out that I wouldn't have gotten, that you wouldn't have gotten, that you wouldn't have gotten, right. and he could have just given them back. No. Nobody. And he was an idiot, By and the he way, didn't do it. Nobody would have gotten it. Uh, a, a, a war hero, General Petraeus, didn't, didn't get, get that option. A former CIA director, Deutsch, didn't get that. Former National Security Advisor, Sandy Berger, didn't get that. They got charged. And you know, Willie, think about it. The two things that Donald Trump really are in the mo is in the most trouble for right now with the feds. One, the documents. He could have just returned them. When they asked for him, he could have returned him. He, he refused to. It was him sitting there with the documents that got him in trouble. And then January the 6th, he could have very easily, when, when, when police started getting the hell beaten out of them, yep. he could have gotten online and said, leave the Capitol. Don't do this. There's a better way. He sat there and stared at cops getting brutalized and beaten and the Capitol getting vandalized with, a, with rioters, 
And he did absolutely nothing for a couple of hours. In fact, watched it allegedly gleefully in the dining no. room just off the Oval Office as his people were trying to fight for him, he believed. And the, the reason that he didn't give these back, these documents back, is because, as the indictment makes clear, he genuinely believed they were his. These are mine, he says again and again. These are mine. Well, do you remember really how as, we had talked about my army, my generals, yes, my, my generals. secretary of state, my this, my Justice Department? But he also knew he, there was a process. He never... He he knew there was a process. They told him there was a process, but you're right, Willie. He didn't realize, and I've said this to people walking into the White House, you don't own this. You rent it for mm -hmm. four years, and, and hey, you if you're lucky, American you're, you're in there. He never got that. Here, former George W. Bush aide Carl Rove is out with a new piece in the Wall Street Journal titled Trump invited this indictment. Rove writes this, quote, America has been plunged into an unprecedented crisis by the indictment of Donald Trump on 37 felony counts. The case will further tear our country apart as it has a heavy impact on the presidential campaign and wrongly undermines confidence in our justice system. The blame for this calamity rests solely on Mr. Trump and his childish impulse to keep momentum from his time in the Oval Office, no matter what the law says. And that is the way Donald Trump viewed them as mementos, Gene mm -hmm. Robinson, as yeah. keepsakes. If you read through the indictment, it's not just yeah. the New York Times reporting this strange fetish for the boxes, but in the indictment, mm -hmm. Trump's own assistant calls these the beautiful mind boxes and says, no, he wants those on Air Force yeah. One with him, like traveling with the documents. He genuinely yeah. and incorrectly believed they brought, belonged to him personally. Yeah, and in addition to be a, being a bad person, Donald Trump is a, is a deeply weird person. And you remember that point, <laughs> that point in the in the indictment where he's talking to to Evan Corcoran, his lawyer, right, and about you know the the, the pluck him out uh, conversation, and and he's saying I, I don't I don't want anybody going through my boxes. I don't want you going through my boxes. It's 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 almost a kind of Gollum in Lord of the Rings right. moment. You know my precious uh right. he has this it's it's like a hoarding instinct about um about these documents uh some sort of weird security blanket some sort of of uh, it, it boosts his ego and reminds him uh, that he actually somehow became president of the united states i don't know what it what it is about it um but it's pathological uh, in addition to being criminal you know gene also uh, carl rove goes on to say this is all donald trump's fault republicans know it's donald trump's yeah. fault yeah and yet yeah. they're acting like the worst uh, yeah, progressives that, that they they have contempt for uh, 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 trying to defund the police and Karl Rove makes the point <laughs> hey idiots <laughs> defunding the FBI that's yeah. not any better than defunding San Francisco's police department right exactly and and they're taking these crazy positions uh, that they don't believe in in order mm -hmm. to uh, not offend Donald Trump's base uh, uh, they think that the, their political careers are are over if they offend the guy and so they stick with him inexplicably because he's he's now facing these federal felony charges there are going to be more felony charges uh, it's this is this is the guy they've decided they're going to stake their party's future on. Uh, I think that's a, a political mistake in addition to being a tragedy for the country. But but they're, they're there. They're not profiles in courage, that's for sure. So, Chuck Rosenberg, it's hard not to chuckle a little bit when we're hearing these reports about him hoarding these boxes and dragging them all over the place and not letting anybody have them. But... Are we underestimating the gravity of the situation, calling these documents mementos? It seems to me they're a little bit more oh, than mementos. So and more. it seems to me that, I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence and things we're seeing around the edges here, mm -hmm. family connections to Saudi Arabia, money changing hands, large amounts of it to family members. It seems to me these documents might have been not only highly classified and dangerous for Americans who are serving this country, but expensive if you're in the mood to sell them. If Donald Trump were in the mood to sell them at some point. Yeah, I think that's right, Mika. So 
two things. First, what you're talking about goes to motive. And motive is always interesting. <clears throat> and as a prosecutor, if you can prove motive, all the better, because it helps the jury understand the case and why a defendant did what a defendant was alleged to have done. But you don't need it, right? The government doesn't have to show that he wanted to monetize these documents or he wanted to use it in some other nefarious way. They just have to show, as the statute requires, that he had this stuff and he unlawfully mm -hmm. retained it. And by the way, point number two, and Elise and Richard both referred to this, the obstruction charges make that so much easier for the government. So in order to prove intent, you have to crawl into someone's mind. And I can imagine, and uh, you know, Eugene is right, Mr. Trump is a weird guy, crawling into his mind would be a really uncomfortable place to go. But the obstruction charges permit you to do that. They evince intent. They help the government meet the burden to show that the retention was unlawful and purposeful and not by accident or mistake. So when you take these two things together, right, the unlawful retention on one hand, the obstruction on the other, it would be nice to have motive, Mika, mm -hmm. but as a legal matter, you don't need it. And by the way, if he was trying to sell this stuff, if he was trying to monetize it, if foreign governments were getting it to help the Trump family, the Trump organization make more dough, I think we would see other charges. I'm pretty confident right. we would. They're not there yet. Now, doesn't mean they don't get there, but they're not there yet. And so um, interesting to talk about, but as a legal matter, not mm -hmm. something the government has to prove. So, so Doris, we, we try, um, we try, or at least uh, we try to try to not catastrophize uh, about what goes on every day. Um, I, I stand by exactly what I said about Donald Trump. We, we, we've known him. We've seen him. I still believe he would do whatever yes. he could get away with doing uh, and do anything to anybody that stood in his way uh, uh, of even more power. Um, but we have a system of checks and balances, Madisonian democracy, uh, thanks to the judi judicial branch mainly, uh, held the line against Donald Trump's attacks on, on American democracy. I, I am curious, though, uh, if you, uh, what your thoughts are as we start to move into an election year and we see just how grand the stakes are here, how massive, how massive the consequences are over for, for what Americans decide to do over the next 14, 15 months. You know, Joe, I think <clears throat> on the one hand, <clears throat> excuse me, on the one hand, he has already told us in the CPAC talk that what he wants to do in that next term is retribution. He wants reprisals. And what I'm reminded of today is this very day, June 16th, was also when Lincoln accepted at the State House his nomination by his Illinois convention to be running for the president of the United States. And what he was arguing throughout his entire presidency was you do not want retribution. In his very last day as a cabinet office, in the cabinet, he told the people, I want to extinguish hate. I don't want vindictiveness. If the people who rebe rebel leaders want to leave the country, shoo them, get them out of here. If they stay, they will be punished. But I want us to get back to a union, just the opposite of where President Trump, former President Trump is now. But on the other hand, I think we've been seeing something, even in this talk, as we've had in these last couple of minutes, public sentiment is slowly changing. That's different from public opinion. We get all screwed up as soon as we hear mm -hmm. public opinion. Oh, my God, they still like Trump. The Dallas Morning News, the Wall Street Journal, Carl Rove today, the Christianity Today editorial, people are beginning to say that we know what he did was wrong. And even if the judge, we don't know what those rulings she's going to make are, the real battle is public sentiment. That's different from public opinion. Hmm. What Lincoln said, it's a really sent feeling that people begin to sense that something's not right with what is being done and we want something different and I really think we're beginning to move in that direction do we really want a slogan as his so far has been of retribution or reprisal or America's a mess I'm gonna make it better or do we want the kind of slogans like square deal fair deal new deal morning in America mm -hmm. the American country still is an optimistic country that wants us to move forward and I really think it's time for him to go and that people are beginning to feel that and if public sentiment keeps speaking out that's the battle that wasn't 
wasn't one after January 6th. I thought it would be one then. I thought then. And that's the only scary thing. You think it before. Maybe this is going to not be the time. But I do think the accumulation is setting in. And people who were not speaking out before are beginning to. His opponents are going to have to say something. But more important, the people are going to say, do we really, really want to go through this again? And I don't think they're going to say yes. Uh, I really, don't... really don't. Doris, let's let's dig in just a little bit more on Abraham Lincoln on on this anniversary of, of, of let's talk about the Lincoln anniversary. Um, it's it's always struck me um, that after the South started a war over slavery, they killed 600, 700,000 Americans. It was Abraham Lincoln uh, that 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 talked about uh, with, with with malice toward none. Um, even after all of that, it was Grant uh, who showed uh, extraordinary uh, grace at Appomattox, despite the fact that he had had so many people that he knew uh, killed uh, by the, the Confederates. Uh, it was Sherman, even after his march across Georgia, his right. march to the sea, he got to Savannah and actually told the Confederates, listen, I'm coming north. I'm going to do the same thing through the Carolinas that I did to Georgia, but I'll get, I'll, I make you this promise. You can leave your families here. You can leave your wives here. You can leave your children here in Savannah. You all surrendered, so we didn't burn it down. I'm coming north for you. You can go north, but I'm going to take care of your families. And I'm going to go around Savannah and let my soldiers know that their safety is in my hands. So you go... You worry about me because I'm coming after you, but you don't have to worry about your wife. You don't have to worry about your kids. That is the extraordinary grace, the opposite of retribution that Lincoln, Grant, and Sherman showed during the most horrendous of American wars. And this is an emotion. This is a character trait completely absent in Donald Trump and unfortunately in all those who are around Donald Trump still. You know, Joe, you're so right. I mean, vindictiveness was at its height, of course, as, as the war was coming to an end. All that everybody had suffered. And there's a whole group of people out there that wanted to be vindictive. They didn't want anyone in the Confederate um, government to be able to be teachers or lawyers. But the leadership stood up and said, we're not going to do that. We're going to extinguish hate. You know, in fact, um, Lincoln said, I want them to have their guns to go back. They need to shoot the birds or animals in their property. Let them up easy. Let them up. And that's what we need now. We need leadership to begin to that vindictiveness is going to be out there for people who are upset with what, what is happening to Trump because they believe in him. But the leaders have to be able to speak out and begin to educate the country. One of the things Lincoln always said is you allow, if you allow yourself to fester with poisonous emotions like anger or vindictiveness or trying to get back at people, you'll poison yourself. And that's what will happen to this country unless those, those mo moments of vindictiveness are squashed. And I think we're seeing more people now that are going to be willing to understand that. And, and that's the battle that's going to be fought right now. But I don't think we're on a losing end of that battle. I, I know I've said that before, but I really think now we're seeing it.